This session will be led by Medina and it's on the topic of climate change and how it relates to biomechanics. And whenever you're ready, Medina, I think we can start your session. Um, this will also be the session that will use the other activity kit labeled climate. So please get that ready if you have your kit uh, with you and you'd like to follow along. Yeah, so take it away, Medina. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Medina. I'm a third year PhD student here at CMU, and my session will be on you know, climate change and biomechanics. So I'll just give you like a few seconds to prepare like your drinks, water, and a fruit juice of your choice, uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, but we'll have an opportunity to get that later if you're not like fully ready yet. So I'll just get started. As an overview, I'll first give a intro, brief introduction onto what climate change is. We'll do our activity on pH, and then we'll look at three research studies to see how climate change impacts animal organism biomechanics. And we're going to look specifically at just two climate change impacts, ocean acidification and sea level rise, and then conclude with some mitigation efforts to protect our environment. So why do you think we care about climate change? Do you want to unmute or put it in the chat? You know, how many of you have heard about climate change and what causes it? You can put like whatever you know in the chat. Ariana says global warming. Ah, yes, global warming is a big issue in regards to climate change. So with the rising temperatures, as a result of global warming, uh, the glaciers are melting. So that leads to sea level rise. Um, there's also increased frequency of storms, hurricanes. As you can see, like this house is practically underwater. See something else in the chat. Uh, wildlife. Yeah, wildlife is you know being impacted a lot from climate change. And then we also have wildfires as a result of the increase in temperatures and the increased frequency of droughts. Um, this leads to higher prevalence of wildfires. Um, when it comes to climate change, we're mainly looking at CO2. So we have CO2 in the atmosphere. It can react with water and sunlight. And this is a process called photosynthesis that happens you know, through plants. Plants can also breathe out CO2. Um, animals can also breathe out CO2. Um, the waste from plants and animals can decompose and form fossil fuels. An um, example of fossil fuels are coal or petroleum and natural gas. But these fossil fuels can be combusted to form electricity. That releases even more CO2 in the atmosphere. And CO2 is called um, a greenhouse gas because um, it acts as a greenhouse, it traps the heat and kind of warms the planet. Um, so where do you think CO2 comes from? Like what type of sources? You can uh, post in the chat again. And no wrong answers. Factories. Yep, that's one with industry. Many different types of you know factories emit CO2 in like their production. Humans, yeah, we emit CO2. <laughs> Many different types of activities. Car emissions, yep, that's spot on. That's pretty spot on. Um, if you look at climate change, like the definition, it's the long-term changes in temperature and weather patterns that are mainly due to human activity. Someone mentioned uh, cars, you know, cars emit CO2 from like the exhaust or the smoke. Power plants, you know, emit CO2 when they're producing electricity and also from, you know, farming equipment. These are just like a few, you know, sources of where CO2 comes from. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about the major causes of climate change. You know, CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. Is there any other greenhouse gases that you guys know of? That you want to put in the chat? Um, there's also uh, methane and nitrous oxide. Um, but in this presentation, I'm just mainly going to be focusing on you know, carbon dioxide or CO2. Uh, so this plot shows the CO2 levels since pre-industrial times. And as you can see, the, the CO2 has been steadily increasing over time and is been continuing to increase um, as a result of you know, emissions from you know, human activity. 
And the CO2 levels like oscillate, they peak during certain times and they, they you know, reach a minimum during certain times. In the Northern Hemisphere, the CO2 levels tend to peak in the fall and the winter time because you know, plants are breathing out CO2. And then in the spring and summer time for photosynthesis, the plants are taking in CO2. So that's when we see uh, CO2 levels drop. So now we're going to look at our first climate change impact, which is ocean acidification. So we have CO2 in the atmosphere or in the environment. Um, it can dissolve into the oceans to form carbonic acid, which we can represent by hydrogen ions. So what do you think happens to carbonic acid as we increase the CO2? Do you think the CO2 levels decrease? Um, increase or like stay the same? Uh, what do you think happens when we increase CO2? Increases? Um, yes, that's correct. As we increase the CO2, we have more CO2 that's being dissolved in water. So we're forming more carbonic acid. So we can measure the, uh, how acidic you know, the water is becoming by looking at the pH. So that leads us into our activity. If you haven't already, you can prepare your cup of water and your cup of fruit juice. So now we're going to measure the pH. So I have apple juice, you can see. We can like dip the uh, pH strip into the apple juice and it should change, the pH should change very quickly. Um, so while you're getting that done, I can show the, the pH chart. So just explaining how it works. So the pH um, can range from uh, 0 to 14. Here I'm just showing 0 to 7. A pH of 7 means that the, it's typical of a pH of pure water. Um, it's neutral. And a pH of less than 7 means that the solution is more acidic. So we have more hydrogen ions. And the pH greater than eight means the solution is more basic, and then we have less hydrogen ions. Um, so once you have like the pH of each of your drinks, you can put that in the chat and then say if the solution is acidic, you know, basic or neutral. I guess while I'm waiting for some responses, I can just show you again how like we just measure the pH, it's like very like easy and quick to do. If there is a change, it should change like pretty rapidly. With the water, I'm not really you know, seeing much of a change. The pH is kind of close to seven. And then with the apple juice, um, I'm seeing a pH of like around three-ish. Someone else used apple juice, they got around three. That's cool. Water neutral, lemonade acidic, water slightly acidic. Yeah, cool. Seems like everyone's coming to the same similar conclusions. Oops. Yeah, I can show you um, the result that I got when I did this like sometime last week. Uh, the pH for water that I got was around six. It's slightly acidic and it's close to neutral, you know, which is good. It means I have healthy water. And then apple juice, I got pH of around 3.5, so it's more acidic. So why do you think we did this activity? Um, why do you think pH is you know, important for the environment and for like you know, marine life, such as fishes? Why do you think you know, pH is important? Life could be harmed by higher pH water. You can indirectly show how much CO2 is in the substance. Yeah, that, those are you know good uh, points. Because um, you know certain marine life like to live at you know a certain pH, and if that you know balance of ions are being changed, that can affect um, their environment. So I mentioned um, water becoming more acidic, which can be harmful. 
you know, these are all really great points. Uh, the point that I want to focus on is that as the oceans become, you know, more acidic, uh, calcium carbonate decreases, and this isn't great, in, you know, particularly for marine organisms. They need calcium carbonate to form their shells and their skeleton. So this is really important for like their, their structure. The first study that we're going to look at are mussel shells. Uh, mussels are important for the environment because they, you know, clean and purify the water. They're also an important source of food. You know, fishes and turtles eat mussels and also birds. You know, we humans also eat mussels. I haven't personally tried mussels, but you know, some of you may have like be familiar with eating mussels. So now we can look at the results from the research study. So they measured the tissue mass of like the mussel shells. So they're comparing um, ambient conditions to what they consider to be a, nor a more normal pH for the mussels. And then comparing that to a lower pH condition that represents ocean acidification. And the tissue mass decreased from 120 to about 80 nanograms. So because the tissue mass you know, decreases, the shells are you know, becoming smaller and they're also becoming weaker as a result of ocean acidification. And this is you know, an important issue for mussels because if they're smaller, that means like the predators and people that um, eat mussels have to eat a higher quantity of them in order to like, like, sustain, like sustain themselves and like their diet. So that means that the mussels become you know, more vulnerable as a result of um, ocean acidification. The next study that we can look at are corals. This is a beautiful picture of corals in the Great Barrier Reef. Corals are home to many fish species, sea turtles, and whales. They're important in you know, protecting our coastlines from waves and floods. It's also important for recreation as you know, people go snorkeling. So this really brings in a lot of money for the economy. So next we can transition into like the results of this research study and how so they looked at how the coral skeleton changes with CO2 and also temperature. Reminder, we care about CO2 because you know, those emissions come from you know, vehicles and human activity and they lead to global warming. So here we have the results of the, uh, the CO2 study. We have image A and image E. Which image do you think has more CO2, A or E? Be two votes for E, three votes for E. Looks like E is winning, which is right. Um, the image on the left has less CO2 and more carbonate, you know, which is good because we have more carbonate to form the coral skeleton. And then image E, we have more CO2 and less carbonate. So as you can see, the, the coral skeleton is more broken down than the image, uh, than image A. Then we can look at the temperature impacts um, because you know, global warming is a big problem. The corals will also be impacted by the temperature increase. We have image A versus image C. Uh, which image do you think has a higher temperature? The differences aren't as drastic, but which one do you think has a higher temperature, A or C? Yeah, any answer is valid. It's hard to notice the differences as compared to the CO2, like which one has um, the higher temperature. One vote for C. Any question mark? Yeah, this one's a little tricky. It's hard to tell the differences. Um, in image A, the temperature is 27 Celsius and in image C, the temperature is two degrees Celsius higher. So. And as you can see, like, like the skeleton kind of breaks down a little bit more for image C, and then the color changes a little bit. Well, it's not as drastic as you know the first comparison, um, but with temperature increases, the, the skeleton can break down. Corals are not only, you know, not the only organisms that are impacted by you know temperature. Also, polar bears, you know, are very affected by the rising temperatures. And temperatures in the Arctic are increasing twice as fast as the global average. 
So this leads to ice sheets melting and that leads to sea level rise. And as a result of that, the polar bears have to move on shore. And it also makes it difficult for polar bears to find their, major, their main source of food, which are ice seals. And if this ice is melting, it just becomes even more difficult for them to search for ice seals. So in this last study, they're comparing polar bears to brown bears because polar bears have evolved from brown bears and looking at their diets and like their skulls. Now brown bears are omnivores, so that means they eat meat and plants. And polar bears are carnivores, they mainly eat fleshy meats. If you look at the skull of a brown bear, um, it has like a false a, a vaulted forehead, has this little curve as compared to like the polar bear skull, which is a bit flatter. And the reason that the polar bear has evolved to have a you know, flatter like uh, forehead, it just makes it easier for like the polar bear to like dig into the ice and to um, find like their sources of food. So before I show like their you know, results of like their study, uh, which one do you think has a stronger skull, a polar bear or a brown bear? Maybe based on what you know about like their diet, the types of food that they like to eat. You think that they would need like more support from their school or like less support? Two votes for the polar bear. I mean, two votes for the brown bear. <laughs> Three votes for the brown bear. One vote for the polar bear. But the brown bear is winning. Interesting. Another vote for the polar bear. Looks like we're evenly split. This is interesting. Okay, uh, so now I'll share the answer. Um, so this is like the result of like their modeling study looking at the skull of the polar bear versus the brown bear. And the more lighter color means that the, the skull strength is stronger. So they found that the brown bear has a stronger skull than the polar bear. Are you surprised by this result? Uh, you can just put yes or no, or explain why if you want to. Like if you were surprised that the brown bear has a stronger skull, or if you weren't surprised, then why, would, why weren't you not surprised? Not seeing any responses quite yet. The scientists actually found this result kind of surprising because they would expect uh, carnivores to have like stronger skulls. But then when we look at the diet of a polar bear, polar bears like eating uh, like fleshy meats, but they don't actually need that much support from like their skull. So that's why they've evolved to have weaker skulls as compared to like the brown bears that eat you know, meat that has bones and like plants. So that requires a lot of breakdown. So they need a lot more support from their skull. This was, this was like a really um, interesting result that they found. So now we can look at um, mitigation efforts to protect their organisms. For mussels, they're being impacted by dams. Just one of the many sea organisms that are you know, being impacted by dams. So dams control the flow of water. So we can look at, you know, how dams are designed and, you know, like the water flow that they're using to kind of see if we can minimize the damage that the mussels are being impacted by. For corals, the problem is like the use of single-use plastics. So the thought of like microplastics in the ocean, this can be detrimental to corals. If they're like consuming like those microplastics. Um, one of the strategies that the scientists like suggested was to actually grow corals in the lab and like fuse them together and like to form coral reefs and then put those back in the ocean. Another strategy is to add some chemicals to, to like kind of restore the pH back to what it was normally. And then another one is to develop me medicines for corals that are being stressed out by you know, the rising temperatures or from the oceans becoming more acidic. 
Uh, for polar bears, uh, one option is to airdrop some food. This is like a last resort. I really recommend it to feed polar bears since they have like specific diets. But this is like as like a last case scenario if like we can't do anything else to save the polar bears. Um, another strategy is to transport uh, polar bears from one part of the Arctic into um, a different part where like there's a higher polar bear uh, population and where like the ice sheet part melting as drastically as, as, as a different part. Another strategy is to provide them with surrogate brown bear moms. You now since like the polar bears are moving on shore. I'm not sure how well this would work, but these are just some strategies that have been like suggested. Uh, but there's something that's even better than this. Like, what do you think is even more effective or impactful in you know protecting these organisms from climate change? Like, what do you think is even better than like these strategies? Someone posted preventing climate change from getting worse. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah, we have to go back to climate change, like going back to the source, which is, you know, CO2, um, the culprit of climate change. You know, CO2 is in the atmosphere, you know, comes from many different sources, um, from vehicles, from, you know, power plants, you know, from animals, you know, from many different sources, like release CO2 in the atmosphere. So we can, you know, focus on reducing CO2, you know, so the organisms don't have to be impacted by, you know, climate change in the first place. So we can look at, you know, using less vehicles like to drive and just, you know, bike more or walk more, just kind of lower the, um, lower our carbon footprints. And we can plant trees, you know, because plants, you know, absorb CO2. So that can be like one of the strategies. Uh, we can use more energy efficient devices or, you know, build, you know, buildings that, or construct buildings that release like less CO2 that are more efficient. And, and like another strategy that people don't really like think of much is like the fashion industry. Um, actually, it takes a lot of energy to, to produce a piece of clothing and takes a lot of water, even like transporting clothes from one part of the world to another part that takes up a lot of, that requires a lot of energy and that releases a lot of CO2. So we can look at shopping more sustainably or even buying less to kind of like reduce CO2 emissions. Um, but you can also, you know, make an impact. You can be cool. You can study biomechanics and or climate change. Uh, there's many different subjects that you can, you know, study. You can go into the sciences. You can study chemistry, uh, biology, physics, animal science. You can study engineering. These are just like a few, mechanical, environmental, electrical, biological engineering. You can also go into the science communication. It was important for us to have journalists, you know, educated about climate change and that want to like educate the public about what's going on. I mean, not only climate change, but, you know, biomechanics and other like science topics, like breaking it down for, you know, a general audience. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Medina. We do have a few minutes left. So if anyone wants to unmute to ask questions or you can drop them in the chat and um, we could definitely address any and all questions that you have. It could be about climate change. It could be about how you can study climate change or maybe some, some things you can do to try and mitigate some of the effects of climate change. So just let us know. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if you're not getting any questions, that means you did a great job breaking all of this information down, oh, wow. kind of like <laughs> where you're hitting at for science communication. And that's really important. It's a good skill to have. It's not only important for um, the scientists themselves or the engineers themselves to understand all of these very complex topics, but also so that other people can also understand what's going on. This can even go into um, our law system to try and help create policies for mitigating climate change. That's also another important thing. But all of this, I think you did a great job, especially if you're not getting many questions, then it must mean that 
you know, it was very engaging and, and easy to understand. So thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to, you know, present this topic. Yeah, and if any questions come up afterwards, feel free to email us. We'll be happy to put you in contact with Medina for any climate change and biomechanics related questions if they come up afterwards. But for now, I think this has been the end of our session and end of our virtual National Biomechanics Day at Carnegie Mellon. Just as a quick wrap up conclusion, we do have a feedback survey available. It is anonymous and we would love for everyone to fill it out just so we can make National Biomechanics Day better in the future. And we would also love to see all of you back with us again next year because uh, this is an annual thing. So we'll be holding this every year. If you have any more questions for any of the sessions or um, anything biomechanics related, feel free to drop them in the chat or send, send it to our email at biomechdayandrew.cmu.edu. If you also need to find the feedback survey link or our email later, it should be on our Canvas page. So thank you everyone for participating. We loved all the questions and all of your thoughts of what was going on um, biomechanics related. And we hope you had a good time with us. So yeah, thank you. And uh, let us know if there's any more questions. Thanks for coming. We hope you learned a lot. <laughs>